to YouTube. Okay. Hey, everybody. We are live. This is uh, Scott Homan with the Witness Underground Film and Podcast. And today we have two, one, one guest, uh, Mike Allen Losh, with the Apostasy Book Trilogy and Anthony Matheny. And both, all three of us are on the Witness Underground team and running a Kickstarter right now. But can you give us a quick um, intro to the three books that you wrote, Micah? Oh, yeah. So um, each book uh, is titled after a shaming term Watchtower uses for people who have left. So my memoir is called Mentally Diseased. Uh, The second book in the trilogy is a collection of poetry and prose I wrote over two decades, and it's called Gangrenous Speeches. And then the third book is a uh, a horror novella called Despicable, which is coming out uh, 1210 of this year. And each book also features um, art by a different XJW artist. Um, and that's, I don't know, I think almost three years now, that's what I've been doing with most of my free time. Okay. What are the three artists? Can you give them a shout out to that, that did your book cover art? Yes. Um, the Sarah Riches did the cover for Mentally Diseased. Um, the second artist um, goes by the Holistic Hue on, well, formerly Twitter, now X. And then Stuart Fletcher is making the uh, cover for Despicable. Amazing. And then, Anthony, can you quick introduce yourself as, um, well, introduce yourself and with what you've created? How would you like me to introduce myself? Hi. I'm Anthony. <laughs> Happy to work with uh, Scott and Micah on the Witness Underground documentary project and get the word out there. Uh, Happy to meet up with Micah and learn about his books because he's really prolific. He's written what is three. It's been three in what, three years or less than that. So three books in a year, over a year, um, six months for, for, you know, satanic imagery. (laughs) Yeah, it's and you're quicker than I even thought you were. So that's awesome. Uh, I just want to just uh, say right now, I got a new documentary I've helped produce. It's called a psychedelic revolution. And that's just popped up for rent or purchase on wow. Amazon, Apple, Google play, the usual places. So if folks want to check that out. But I'm most excited to talk about today is witness underground. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so one thing I haven't said, and I don't always preface the show with, is that all of us are were once a part of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we are former members post GW XJW, and that has generally been the theme of the Witness Underground podcast: is artists and musicians who have left that particular group, and that will expand over time to other groups, of course. Um, but I'm always trying to work with people who have something to show, something that they've created. Um, so one thing I wanted to get into is: so we've been the three of us and a, a larger team of about it's like. It's like eight people plus another group of like 10 more people who are really helping get the word out about Witness Underground's release. And we have a Kickstarter. So if you're listening to this, please check out the witnessunderground.com. That redirects to our Kickstarter campaign. It has uh, nine more days to go or 10 more days to go. We're really in the last two weeks here. Um, we'd love to have you check it out. I want to see what you guys have thought about working on the Kickstarter. You've been both very, very involved. You want me to go first? Yeah, or, sure. Okay. Honest, honest answers. <laughs> uh, no, I've I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's been cool to. Uh, I mean, I've never been involved with anything like this before, really. So you know, it's been cool to see people react and um, to meet other people who are passionate about. Um, it, it's nice to find people who, you know, are trying to use art to heal, and I think that has a lot of merit. And I feel like that's not maybe that common in the community, or maybe I just hadn't stumbled across it as much but it, it's really nice to to find that and i think it's a project with a lot of merit thanks my experience is, is that kickstarters are always hell i'm like an old veteran like trading war wounds just because like it's <laughs> so much marketing and promotion and outreach and everything else crammed into just a small window of time so it is a lot of work uh on the plus side i'm really happy uh, with the reach that we're getting with this campaign. Um, it's easy to say, oh yeah, this is a, a documentary that all ex Jehovah's witnesses should see, which I agree. That's true, but it has much broader appeal. The themes, uh, generate conversations. I don't care what kind of a background a person is and conversations, not specifically about the witnesses. 
uh, people I've showed it to, you know, they they take this piece of art and they, you know, they apply some things to their own life and their particular journeys. And that's been amazing. Uh, I love the outreach because it's helped me to connect with people that I've lost track of over the years and catch up and see what they're doing and what I'm doing. And it's kind of uh, reinvigorated a lot of old collaborations that kind of went dormant with uh, life and time. So it kind of outreach has kind of sparked some new projects and getting back in gear on a couple old projects. That's awesome. Yeah. I've had a couple of people, one I'm at a, the emerging filmmakers project, Ben Makinen. He now lives in Indonesia and he's got three, two films out. One's distributed in a similar way that we're distributing witness underground using Bitmax. We're using film hub, but um, that's been really cool to reconnect with him. We, last time we saw each other, it was like an auto parts store in Denver <laughs> just randomly. And you know, seven years later, to, to run into him with this and be like, Oh my God, your film's out. And he's like a big jazz guy in Denver and he's connected to all the old jazz legends of, from the 1950s beat generation. He played with those guys before they passed. He's made two films about jazz. And there's another woman I met in Boulder who like worked on a activist documentary project. Well, she's worked on activism of like oil against, um, sorry, oil spill in Ecuador, um, with, uh, Chevron and Texaco, Texaco. And now there's a whole documentary. They're just about wrapping up. And it's like, oh, I had no idea you worked in doc. You know, it's like, it's been a lot of years. So like, that's been two really cool connections that are related to film that came out of the woodwork. But yeah, reconnecting with people and has been really interesting. Like, it's like years of dialogue all happening in 30 days. <laughs> one, one strange thing about it that I've been happening is like, I'll, I'll, I'll connect with, you know, some old, co old colleague that, you know, I haven't, I haven't done anything with in several years. And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, um, I just have a family member. They're a musician that just got kicked out of the church and they're dealing with the shunning right now. And then, uh, I was talking to my neighbors here about the documentary and they're like, Oh yeah, our friend's a musician and she's an ex Jehovah's witness. And she lives a couple hours away. And we're going to this, uh, you know, Hindu or something festival this week and I'll talk to her. So it's like, I think, I think the documentary is like kind of a time capsule, but uh, with the further witness underground outreach, it's like, man, we are finding a lot of, interesting and varied musicians that also come from a similar background. And I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah. And writing, what's interesting to me is that you both came out of the woodwork. I mean, Anthony, you make music, but both of you have written and I've, I've kind of, I've always had a desire to write and uh, I've been writing now um, with like, it's like write as little as possible for the biggest impact or like get, be really direct and clear with your writing um, with the witness underground project and the film and like, honing my writing skills through this filmmaking process. Um, but it's interesting because there's so many musicians a part of this 32 albums that we're, we're releasing with the film as part of like donated art, but the people that really stepped up were authors. And I, <laughs> and it's it ultimately like Kickstarter is actually a writing process. It's like, a, it kind of makes sense in a way. Like go make a song about our Kickstarter. doesn't really like function <laughs> <laughs> for outreach. <laughs> yeah, Jingle would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that next time. <laughs> Cool. Well, I really appreciate all of your help and outreach. And if you're if you're listening to this, um, check out the Kickstarter first of all, and you can get both Anthony's books and the Apostasy trilogy um, from Micah. And the the cool thing about Micah's books is we actually listed them as eBooks um, in in the in the campaign, but you're going to get them as physical copies um, when you when you uh, contribute to the process when you pledge to the Kickstarter. Um, so that's like a, like a special bonus that everybody. Who, who gets Micah's books gets a physical copy. Uh, get but excited, we, everyone. You've got a physical Christmas uh, apostasy trilogy from Michael to send, or Micah to send to your, your Jehovah's Witness loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after, you, uh, after you, yeah, get, get multiple copies, get multiple uh, contributions in the Kickstarter for us to get, fill those stockings. <laughs> <laughs> Micah, can you give us like a, I'm really curious about the second one, Gangrenous Speeches, also the name. Um, mm -hmm. And and what kind of poetry would we find in, in your second book? So um, I've, I've always written, I started writing, I um, the first poem I wrote um, that I didn't throw away, I wrote when I was 18. So that was um, three years after my dad died. And it's about him. And I actually have it tattooed on my back. I'm not going to show you, but um, I don't know. Um, 
I, I know when I showed people that they always reacted to it and not just because it was sad, but I think um, people seem to connect with it. And so I wanted to pursue that. So um, it has like e emo love poems about my first girlfriend and, and who actually I've, I've reconnected with after almost 20 years. And um, I even sent her a copy and let her read it. And she said, like, I think she said, I went from like kind of having hope to just being fed up with bullshit and just like, not maybe not so much bitter, but just, I mean, I think in those circumstances, you know, to be abused for decades, it just, it does something to a person, it, you know, it'd be dishonest. Um, but there are kind of some musings on life people I encountered and even like little, um, little things I just, uh, I think there's one it's about like somebody is being fed to zombies in like some, I, I don't explain it. It's just creative that's writing. Like, yeah. Just weird thoughts that I would have. I would just pursue. And um, when I write, I've never, I, I mean, I want the, the reader to be entertained, but I don't care if they get what they want. Like I like stuff that surprises you or is very much like it, David Cronenberg. I don't know anybody who do, they either love his movies or hate them, but nobody's like, yeah, they're okay in my experience. So I kind of, um, I got more into just kind of writing weird things. I don't know. It just me spilled out onto paper. Um, mm -hmm. And when, you know, I, I titled my memoir mentally diseased. And then I was like, well, what do I call all of these things? And then I found a watchtower set avoid apostates gangrenous speeches and i was like well that's utterly absurd and pretentious i love it so <laughs> <laughs> cool yeah it's interesting it's almost like a collection of of the micah short stories in a sense like what was going through your head as a <laughs> as you're dealing with the cognitive dissonance or yeah. the pressures yeah. from the religion yeah there there are some that are very clearly about me dealing with my faith or just problems I would see in the congregation and how they were mistreating people. And it was a safe place for me to write, but I also wrote a bit vaguely. And a lot of those, I, I remembered how I had kind of changed it. So I went back and changed them back and added in the profanity before I published it. <laughs> added but, back in profanity. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause, cause in my memoir, there's, there's a poem before each chapter and none of those are in gangrenous speeches and then I even, um, a scene in Despicable, it was kind of a poem, but it became longer, pardon me, but I repurposed that into a certain scene. So, excuse me, I'm having wicked bad indigestion, too much Mountain Dew. Um, yeah. yeah now I see how you write so much. <laughs> yeah, caffeine, <laughs> caffeine and sleep deprivation. But um, yeah, it, it, it is really just a time capsule. And I do think it kind of shows how my writing changed. Um, later, I got more into not only what I said, but the um, the words used and kind of making them rhyme and have a rhythm. Um, I know George Carlin would kind of do that. And he was always my favorite comedian. Uh, growing up, every time, you know, we'd go to a get together and people would say, who do you want to talk to in the resurrection? And people would be <laughs> like, you know, Moses and Abraham. And then it gets me and I'd be like, George Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be like, well, he 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 had a foul mouth. I'm like, I, I don't care. He was funny. That's who I want to talk to. So <laughs> I, I, I would love to see his, his routine on a Paradise Earth. It'd be like, here's the yeah. 144,000 words you can't say in Paradise. Lucky <laughs> or just something like that. <laughs> and, and you know what's crazy is years ago, I even showed my mom this uh, like 10 minute clip of him ranting about religion. Now she laughed. But something he said resonated with me. And even though it was a dumb joke, he said, when you look around, you see that something is wrong. This is not a work that uh, belongs on the resume of a supreme being. This is the kind of shit you'd expect from an office temp with a bad attitude, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> but that always rattled around in my brain. I'm like, yeah, this just, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. So that's one of the reasons I love art, because you can put in little lines however you do it and somebody down the line might read that and it might save their life. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question for Micah real quick. Um, do I understand correctly that you reuse some poetry and stuff you wrote while you were still within the, the organization? Is that correct? Yeah. Or is so, this all written uh, after you exited? So my first and third book were written after. Um, in my first book, the poetry before each chapter I had written before. And then I just had all this unused, uh, about a hundred pieces. And that was the middle book. So I did not write those in, uh, yeah. I just wonder as a writer looking back at, at what you wrote, I mean, do you get any new insights? I mean, sometimes I feel like I wrote something, think I was writing one thing. I'll give it some time, some space. I'll look back at it as like, oh, you're writing about, you know, this life circumstance or this feeling. I mean, do you ever see new things in what you wrote? Yeah, uh, I remember I wrote one thing once um, about, well, one of my best friends, but I guess my best witness friend. But um, when I was uh, younger, I was overweight. And I even remember once um, we went on vacation together and the whole trip, he just mocked me for being calling me fat and all this stuff. And so I wrote this poem about someone holding a candle and it, it catches their, I think their dress on fire. It's a woman, but, and, it, and it's kind of like betrayal, but I remember that person did something to me, which was really, really wrong. And of course I tried to go through the channels of the, uh, what the congregation and the elders and, you know, they just dismissed it, dismissed me, you know, told me to wait on Jehovah. So I mean, yes, but also a lot of it, I think it was just, I had so much frustration and I was so isolated because pretty much everyone in the hall avoided me or disliked me because I had depression. That was just all I could do was put, put it in there, but I had to write it in a way where if it was found, you know, I had plausible deniability. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm taking over the other Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, we're co-interviewing. Go ahead. Oh, we're co-interviewing. Great. Um, is, you know, this is, I'm going to just throw it back to music, but but in the documentary, um, I think it's either Eric or Chad says that the songs were never topical about the religion. But when you go back and look at a, a lot of the art material that came out of Nuclear Gopher through through that lens, you say, well, you know, they weren't using these explicit words of, you know, kingdom words or whatever in their songs, but they were often writing about you know, those experiences. And I think, I think writing like literature, music, whatever, where you can make it sound like not what you're writing about. That's kind of a healthy thing, I guess, in those kind of environments. You can like code your ideas into something that only you would know. Yeah. It's actually a creative, like you kind of, in, in some cases you have to, there's, there's actually a film coming out. Um, I won't, I just got the sense of script by this director, actor in LA, in LA. We had a chat yesterday and she's like, I want you to read the script. And it's about her diary while a witness being found by someone, probably family. I can't remember exactly the details. I'm going to read the script. And it's basically a true, a true story to her or very, very influenced by this true story. Probably 90% true. Um, and it gets the, the real part is that it gets given to the elder body. And then she's interrogated by the entire elder body, like line per line of her private diary and like how, demeaning that is and there's stuff in there about you know like she's exploring sexuality and different ideas and beliefs and and it just gets like pushed before like this huge body is like seven different elders or something oh. um so invasive but like this idea of like coding your ideas coding yeah, where I... you're at yeah yeah i never well back um... in the day i i had a blog you know back this is the live journal days uh, sorry, the, the signal's broken. I was just saying, I was having a, a, a blog back in the live journal days, and when the elders pulled me in the back room, finally, it was like I had almost like a whole shelf of blog entries printed out. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I never I never had that. I remember um, in Sing Praises to Jehovah, do you remember in the back, it was all the, the angels or whatever singing? I don't remember if they were angels. It's like a guy holding. <laughs> they were like, yeah, there oh. was one was... Well, I had written the lyrics to a Marilyn Manson song on it. It was called <laughs> the golden age of grotesque. And it's this really stupid thing where he says like, 
like dull dag buzz buzz ziggity zag got my grotesque burlesque drag and my mom found that and was <laughs> so upset with me and like destroyed the book and made me get a new one i mean i didn't go before the elders but i just remember like <laughs> i could just see like i was like 20 and just her disgust at me just like how dare you and i'm like oh my like there was no no profanity in it even yeah, they almost treat their own literature as holy. Like it's not the Bible. Like we can we can make fun of these bad. And it's always <laughs> changing. Yeah. It, well, even I mean JW broadcasting. It's so embarrassing. Um, well, we. I, I'm so well, feel so bad for anyone in that religion who has that as like their. I follow this TV channel. <laughs> like it, you worship a TV channel now. <laughs> like and and a URL logo that only works in one language. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> it's so cringeworthy, and yeah. people will talk about you know, how encouraging it is. And it's just like, well, I remember one time, of course I got in trouble again. I was like, JW broadcasting. I've seen better acting in porn. And I just remember <laughs> all of the air went out of the room. <laughs> I was always getting in trouble. I guess I just, <laughs> I, I had a conversation with my older brother about that. Cause I mean, okay. I used to say like, have you guys seen the Jehovah's witness website? And I've had Jehovah's Witnesses like in, in year 2000 say like, there is no Jehovah's Witness website. If you're looking at websites, Jehovah's Witnesses don't use the internet. We're not allowed to use the internet. What oh, are you yeah. doing? I was like, no, there's like a legit website for the religion. And they're like, no, there is not. You're No. It's like, it was like jw-media.net or something at the time. And I was like, and they had a really bad logo of like a Nike swoosh, but it was like a little bit of doubt. It was like, they don't know what they were doing. Like they hired someone who'd never used the internet to make a website. And I was just like, I was just like always watching see what was going on. And now it's like, no, we don't have books and our God is like, I don't know. Like they're, they're, they're basically living in a 1984 weird reality where yeah. some, the face is on the television and they have to just obey the TV screen now. And it's a website that they're telling everyone to go check out. It's really so strange. Even I went to a memorial to film something in 2018 when I was in Vietnam. And um, nobody had books or paper. They only had apps and iPads and like weird tablets. And I was like, I'm in like another alternate reality. Like, does this religion totally change what it is every 10 years? Like, what's happening? <laughs> well, when they rolled that out, I remember there were people with tablets. You know, they got fancy new ones and the leather uh, cases. And half of our congregation, me included, we were like Luddites. We were like, oh no, if you're not touching the Bible, you're not like interacting with God's word. You're not going to receive the Holy Spirit. And then at some point, I think it was from the stage, they said it, it, it didn't matter if you looked at an actual Bible or a tablet or phone. And then in my, my mind, I was like, oh, that's okay. But at the same time, I knew like when I grew up, when I, or when I was growing up, televangelism was condemned. Christian yeah. rock was condemned. And they were just doing all this stuff, but the new light, you know, it's just, it's like, Oh, you know, you know, so it's, it's crazy now, like with not turning in time. Cause I don't know how you would reconcile that because that was one of the main ways the congregation ostracized me because I was very rarely regular, you know, in, with my preaching, which that makes me want to vomit saying my preaching, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to to get to with your books is would you like I want to empower no, I don't want to empower I want people to feel empowered <laughs> and um, I think that through both of you yeah, making books or you know what I'm planning to write and this film and the songs people are putting together that's available in the Kickstarter everything we've ever dreamed of <laughs> is there with all that art and creativity like would you recommend with with what you have done the way you did it, the way you released it. Um, can you kind of give someone who's thinking about writing something or wondering, you know, is a memoir a good idea? Or like, what do I do with all this old poetry? Um, could you give them a path um, that you think works? Yeah. Uh, so uh, like with me, um, when I was like sitting down thinking, I, I wanted to share my story. I felt like it had merit. I wasn't, too familiar with XGW content. Um, and my memoir deals a lot with uh, depression and, and trigger warning, but, you know, suicide, um, alcoholism. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a dark read, but 
I kind of had to put my ego away to put it out there. Like there in one chapter, I talk about, I stayed overnight with a girlfriend and I didn't sleep with her, but the, the elders asked me very, very intrusive questions. And I mean, it is embarrassing, but in all honesty, they should be embarrassing. But I just had to sit and think, you know, whether or not people hate me, hate this or love it. I had to come to terms with that because it is a very vulnerable thing to put that out into the world. I think if you're going to do that, you should think about it first and really be okay with it. But th then you just have to write it. Um, and for me, I am. Um, so I published my memoir on my 40th birthday to kind of make up for never celebrating any of my birthdays. And then originally I was just going to do that one book, but I, uh, let me see. I got on a website called Upwork. I found an, uh, an editor. I found a lawyer to review it because I didn't want to be sued by Watchtower. Um, on Twitter is where I found Sarah Riches and reached out to her. And I just kind of did all the pieces. I did it piecemeal, you know. And for me, that was a very empowering thing. And I, especially after just being abandoned to die in the streets a little over three years ago, it really made me feel good to know that especially for my son. I want him to, to learn the story, but it just, it was a very personal thing. And, and, and I feel like there's been a lot of personal growth there as well. And, and you know, it just, it led to really cool things. Cause once it came out, then I, I saw people uh, that had written reviews or they said, cause it does kind of end abruptly, but it's really just kind of dealing with, you know, that time period. Um, and then people were like, I'd like to hear more from you. And, um, so yeah, it's it's been a really positive experience, but really writing a book, I mean, that's the hardest part, sitting down and doing it. Um, I heard, uh, I just happened to see a clip because I, I was Googling, like, how do you write a book? How do you tell a story? Um, and there are all the, you know, you can find all these articles or how to even write a memoir almost as fiction where you add like internal monologue and make it more um, interesting, I would say. But uh it, it was Joe Rogan. He just said, if you want to write a book, he said, that that's, he said, so many people won't say they want to do that and they never do. And he said, you know, you need to sit down where you've already ate, you're caffeinated, you're rested and put time into it every single day. And so I just started doing that. Um, originally I tried for an hour, but then some days with work and stuff, I could only do five, 10 minutes, but I made sure I did something. And then even on the days when I was despairing or, or just feeling terrible, you know, I kind of would expand the filter and be like, okay, well, you've written, you know, 15, 20,000 words, this many pages. And then I, I had a few people I met that I trusted and I would, you know, ask them for feedback. And, um, but really I just kind of figured it out along the way, but sorry if I took a long way to, <laughs> Oh, hold on. I can't hear you, Scott. Oh. Could you, thank you, I was muted. Um, could you shorten for the audience the path to um, to doing it? I mean, you gave some tips there, like write, write every day a little bit. Is yeah. there any other like gems of, of knowledge that you've learned? And I guess I can also go to Anthony after, Micah, you've answered that. Um, I mean, I because like the, I guess the technical part, like, you know, buying, buying the ISBN numbers, and all of that is really not that difficult. You just have to research it. But I think planning out your story. Um, I mean, I think if you want to write that you would write, you know, it's it's like I would love to make music, but I can't sing. And when I try and drum, my arms move the same. So, um, <laughs> I mean, for me, it just felt like a very natural thing because um, I had al al always done it. So I just kind of went ahead and did it, you know. There's one thing I, I heard from um, David Lynch. He's like, you want to make a feature film? Um, get some recipe cards, like three by five note cards or what you'd make for an outline for a, a speech um, and, and write down 75 movie scenes and then put them on the ground or a table and then rearrange them in order how you think the story would flow in the most interesting way. And then go write one scene per card. And this card's like a, like a title of the scene. Like this is the scene in the kitchen where the you know, wife talks to the new boyfriend or whatever, <laughs> or whatever the thing might be. And, and then you lay it all out in, in this like creative way. We have like, here's your whole story you're kind of putting together and then go write, go write a thing for each card in detail. 
And I always wonder if there's like any kind of like shortcut fun way to do that for writing. Well, for like, well, yeah, sorry. For, like for me, I guess I had certain parts I want to address and I had them there and then I would revisit and kind of flesh them out. But also um, certain parts where I was very angry or sad, I would find, I would make a playlist of depressing music or empowering, angry music, mm. or even um, one edit I did of mentally diseased. Cause I did 10 or 15 myself before I, I sent it to my editor. I just listened to Eminem. I mean, so for me, music was really empowering and kind of helped me get into the mood for different parts on how to convey that. But mm. for, cool trick. yeah, I, I always kind of plan it in my head before I put it down though. That's how I've always kind of worked, mm. but. Okay. How do you have a trick or a, a method, Anthony, that's worked for you? And maybe you could like tell the audience what books you've worked on to give an idea of the breadth of your work. Oh, sure. Um, my kind of exit novels from Jehovah's Witnesses was uh, Paradise Earth Day Zero, which is a speculative fiction about the end times. And I followed that up with Happiness Next Exit, which is a Jehovah's Witness romance novel. That is available as part of the campaign. <clears throat> and beyond that, I've worked on um, graphic novels and comic books and stuff. Uh, the biggest thing is allow yourself to write like absolute shit. Um, there's so many people that are like, oh, I'm writing a book. Oh, can I see it? Well, I've only got the, the first three paragraphs totally perfected. Okay. And, you know, they spend like forever going back, edit, edit, going back, edit, you know. And I used to do this thing called National Novel Writing Month where you, you were tasked with writing a novel in a month's time which meant that you could nev never write a very good novel in a month's time, but it caused you to write, you know, something of a beginning, something of a middle, something of an end. It caused you to write every day, which is something Micah said, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but yeah, you, you write a terrible first draft, and then you set it aside, you go back to it, and then you write a serviceable second draft. And then the process goes on, maybe you get an editor involved or some outside feedback, and you you do it. So that's it. I just say, allow yourself to write crap. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan's gifting me a typewriter, so I won't be allowed to edit anymore for when I work on my next uh, novel out here. So it's nice. just... <laughs> I'm going to have to see how that writer. goes, man. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I got to be like a legit off-grid writer with my like typewriter, and I'll probably have to switch from cigarettes to a pipe to complete the effect. <laughs> uh yeah, that's that's the biggest tips. I don't know. I'd say get an outside editor, of course, uh, when when the time is right, you know, because mm -hmm. that's always valuable feedback. And I don't know. Be honest. Be true. Use the right How about word. writing, like you've written graphic novels and other other things after writing stuff about the religion. Um, how? What's the difference between like writing something about a very very personal topic, especially something so deep? and insane is what we've all kind of gone through with leaving this faith. Um, how mm -hmm. is that different from writing something that's not associated with that faith? I guess, Micah, you've, you've done three on the topic. Are you going to write something on the topic or are you going to move away from that topic? Oh, does Anthony want to go first or me? Either or, way. Yeah. I, that was a very direct to Micah question. Are you going to write oh, something after the trilogy, um, the apostasy trilogy? We're talking about Micah, oh, Micah sorry. about the apostasy trilogy. So I, I do have an idea for a fourth book, um, but what I want to do, um, I already have a bit of it um, started. I, I want to make a collection of short stories because uh, like mentally diseased is pretty much just, it's just what happened. You know, everything in it is true. Certain things are told in different order to, you know, make it more, uh, make more sense. But, and then, you know, I've written poetry and stuff and then writing uh, a horror story, um, for me, that was easier because mentally diseased is just 120 some pages of horrible thing after horrible thing. And it all happened to me. And there's, the, you know, so every day it's like, oh, let me rip my heart open. And I mean, it was it was very depressing. I, I, I felt such relief to get through that. And then um, gangrenous speeches was kind of revisiting, but like despicable. I don't know. It, it, it was easier to write because it was more fun. Um, I mean, it is based on. I mean, a, fi a fictitious religion and, you know, dark topics, but it, it's hopefully it's a story where it's filled with horrible people, but the main bad guy is like not as terrible as them. So you don't really care what he's having done to them. But um, 
that's been fun. And I just like, like, I love Stephen King. I love Edgar Allan Poe. I love horror movies or like dark music, you know, grunge or metal. So I just want to tell weird stories and, you know, hopefully people like them. Right on. How about you, Anthony? Like, so I wrote those first two Jehovah's Witness novels, like Paradise Earth. You know, it was my kind of grim, bitter, you know, honest look at it all. And I wrote Happiness, which is more lighthearted. After I was like, okay, so I'm done writing in that Jehovah's Witness headspace, even though I left Paradise Earth on a terrible cliffhanger for a book two that never came. <laughs> um, it's just like I was done with trying to be in that headspace. So then I started seeing those like, okay, I'm going to write another novel. Well, what's it about? Oh, it's about another cult, <laughs> you know? Or like the stuff was bleeding into my comic work and stuff. It's like I still, I guess, had feelings to get out about it. Um, but I guess the last thing that I'm I'm currently working on is this this graphic novel about Ernest Hemingway, and it's just that to me was the palate cleanser because Hemingway doesn't get disfellowshipped and his wife doesn't die of a blood transfusion. He just fights Nazis and and sharks and and drinks and it was like to me that i'm looking forward to having that uh, and i'm talking with uh, the artist about you know plan to continue that but you know that that was my palate cleanser that said kind of getting back involved in this whole witness underground thing and having to go out there on a daily basis and tell everybody about your life it's kind of like yeah i guess i should finish that paradise earth book and maybe i'm in a healthy point where i can revisit that headspace and kind of live in it for a few months um yeah, maybe not, but I might try. On Ryan's typewriter, he's gifted me. <laughs> I wonder, could both of you? I mean, Mike, let's start with Micah. There's a theme that we've been talking a lot about with Witness Underground, the film and the podcast, which is um, that using art, creativity, writing, music, etc., can shorten the duration to process trauma, or maybe actually like actually process the trauma whereas many other other methods might actually not do the trick um can you speak to the benefit of having written on the topic and like hitting it straightforward first with a memoir like did that help do you think uh yeah so while i was writing it i had hoped for catharsis and i didn't really get that because i know there's still the good abusing people all over the world you know i even i mean i i'm just aware of that you know my uh so it's not something i can just walk away from but I, what i what i felt was empowerment and then really cool things started to happen like i would have people reach out and say like wow i, I read what you wrote and it's like one person said it's like you read or it's like you wrote a thought my thoughts down you know and so it was really cool because for me, growing up a, a witness, I really never fit in. And then when you're just thrown out into the world, you know, you're like, wow, I don't understand anything. And I don't feel like anybody understands me. So I do feel like um, finding that connection and knowing that you're not the only one who has gone through it, um, it is really beneficial. Um, and it did kind of it once I had written it all down, it was like, okay, I, all of that's between two covers now. And, and, you know, it's on a shelf, but I did kind of feel like I had uh, dealt with it and addressed it by taking something horrible. And hopefully, you know, I wanted to show people, you know, you can lose everything, you can be destroyed, and you can still tell Watchtower to kick rocks, and you can still pursue your passion. And I mean, I wanted to tell my son more that that more than anyone else. But um, yeah, it's just, it's been a really great experience for me personally. And I think the the creative process is a bit alchemical. Um, what you do is you you're transmuting when you're writing about like a bad past, like, you know, you're taking a bunch of shit and turning it into gold. Uh, you're getting your thoughts out and you're making it beautiful, you know, even if it's a real grim, dark book. Uh, there's something about that. You know, if you have a a bug to write, then that's an excellent way to get your feelings out about it. Uh, yes, there are a ton of, you know, Jehovah's Witness type memoirs out there, but your story is unique. 
they're never all the same it's like micah's story is not my story which is not your story scott and yeah i've never written a memoir I, I, happiness was very loosely based on uh, a specific window of my life towards my personal exit and i don't know if i could write a memoir but maybe i'd attempt it someday i feel like it would have to be like a manga series with like individual sagas here's the Jehovah's witness saga here's the Asheville, north carolina saga here's the living in the woods like grizzly adams saga and then whatever <laughs> sagas will come <laughs> It's interesting to compartmentalize um, a life into time segments or intervals. I often think about life that way. Like this is the time now where I'm living in Panama and it rains every day and I'm sitting at a table writing everyone I've ever met in my whole life. That's a set period of time, one month <laughs> of the Kickstarter. Um, but there's, I feel like I've also had like separate circles my whole life. Like I've had like my high school circle, but then even that even had like the jocks, the hockey team, the filmmaking team, the skateboarders, the snowboarders, the musicians, like those are some of those fused together. A lot of those are very separate. And then there was the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then there was like, and then throughout my life, even for like another decade, there was like, well, I'm going to have these two separate circles and they don't really have an intersect. I'm the only thing that goes between those circles. Um, and at some point in my life, I was like, I want to fuse my circles. What will happen if all of my circles collide? And then really interesting relationships happen and like people started dating and then some people got, you know, and it's not like, I'm not taking credit for their successful relationship or their divorce, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting to fuse the circles and like the time intervals, like it's just an interesting way to like see life. Like did my compartmentalizing my life or the lives of the people in my life or my own time. And, and this idea, someone brought up the other day in an interview about like the idea of a witness, the Jehovah's witnesses, um, it's like you're observing, you're observing something, but are you really a part of it? And um, uh, it's a little bit more chaotic if you mix all your circles together. Um, and it's a little bit simpler if you have compartmentalized time. That's, I mean, that's kind of abstract, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> I want to see, I want to read your manga series. <laughs> um, I have a, I have a book idea. So I actually went back to Los Angeles um, Cause I have like the, my, the, my last things I own in my Volkswagen stored at a friend's place. And in there was like my Jehovah's witness leather suitcase or briefcase. I used to go door to door with, and then there's like my mastered audio from my bands, um, like the four original four tracks unmastered that is. And then, and Ryan now has that at the nuclear gopher studio in Minneapolis. He's like becoming the, it's now part of the nuclear gopher archive. Uh, but I had all my journals in there. And the journals started at like 14, 15 when I started playing music. And I was like, all right, the religion's serious. End of the world's coming. Um, I'm, I want to be like Nirvana, like all the contradictions that come with being a teenager. And I was writing. And then it, then it became like, well, I'm taking church notes at the conventions of, of what's going on. Mixed with like poetry. And like this song is influencing me. And this girl's super cute. And here's my drawings of something. Um, and I, so I went there and I got all these journals and I was reading through them just like, is this one valuable or am I taking it with me? I basically brought everything with except for some calendars that have interesting dates. I took photos of every page of every calendar and I have all my, I have like 25 journals over the course of about 10 years with the idea of making something like your second book. It sounds like a little bit mix of poetry, my lyrics mm -hmm. and my notes and my, my journaling um, and the cognitive dissonance that was like obviously present and some me raging against something an elder said or whatever. And it's like just reading through it, I was paging through and I was like, like I was getting nauseous, just like looking at who I used to be. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you uh, both, I guess, but especially Mike, because you just like got your fresh book out and this is the apostasy trilogy interview. Um, what do you think, how would you approach, uh, could you give me advice on how to approach taking that collection and turning it into something valuable? Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, the, I think the great thing about that, too, is, you know, Watchtower is always changing. You know, like we talked about, they're always switching and, oh, we don't do this, but now we do, you know. But those stories are evidence of how it was, you know, how they were. And then so but for me, um, like my story, I wanted to kind of deal with um, indoctrination and propaganda and how I feel uh, it and faith, how all three of those things failed me so many times in my life. You know, my father martyred himself and died for this cult. My mother shuns me. The night my son was born, my mother told me to deny him blood when he was flown to Riley. 
And it didn't come to that, but I don't know whether or not I would have, you know, denied him blood. Like that's the control they had over me. So I think maybe trying to find a theme within all of them and then pull a thread through it, you know, cause I think it was Stephen King. I mean, he said, kill your darlings, you know, and in my memoir, that was just what happened. Um, but I think, you know, it, if you can make it cohesive, it, it'll have more impact, you know, cause, yeah. um, but yeah, I think it's just, those things are so cool because you can look back with disgust and say like, oh God, like, but, but at the same time, you're like, well, what did they do to this poor kid? You know, like he didn't understand and, you know, and you didn't know what you didn't know. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's to, to be vulnerable and talk about the mistakes and just how it failed you and caused problems in your life, I think is, I mean, that's kind of what I try to do with mine, but you know, I, I don't want to tell you how to tell your story. <laughs> yeah. What do you both think about the idea of uh, there's an ex witness, Dan Clark, I think I can't remember. I'm probably, that's probably not the right person. There's an ex witness and he just did this YouTube thing. And he's like, someone gave him this gift that was basically like, stop telling that story that's not who you are. That's something in your past. What do you want your story to be? Cause, and I think there's a lot of that happening um, personally, but also within the ex-witness community of people f- sort of feeling stuck in that identity and also in the drama of being an ex-witness and the religion being oppressive and influencing their lives for the worst um, about like, yeah, let's tell our story, but then like move on is, or is this writing a book help us do that? Or is it like keep us stuck? Cause it's like, now it's a part of our product we're pushing and now we have to like do book tours and go on interviews and talk about oh, yeah. it. <laughs> um, it. Do you want to respond to that first, Anthony? Yeah. Why don't I? Cause I got to jump out for another thing here. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It's hard. There's like, you know, a part of me that would be like, Oh, I never wanted to go back into Jehovah's witness space ever again in my life. And here I am in support of Witness Underground because I believe in it. I want to get the word out about it, you know, having to go back out in there and tell these stories. So what you said is valid. Like you write a book. Okay. Do you want to sell the book or get it readers? Well, that means going and and telling your story. And, you know, that's, that's a tough thing to do. Can you mentally handle it? I think there's value in doing it early on. What I'm trying to learn right now is there value doing it, you know, 10 years down the road or even longer in my case down the road where, you know, you've got some ground behind it. Uh, The, the emotions maybe aren't so raw anymore and, you know, heightened. Uh, Maybe you can have more objectivity to look back at things. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting experiment in my life right now. So I have to see how it all shakes out, but I do believe there's value in creative expression, be it writing or music. And I encourage everybody to do it. Thanks for that. Um, All right. See, you're heading out, Anthony. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have another meeting to attend to, but I'll just encourage everybody because it's the right time to do so. Please back Witness Underground on Kickstarter. Um, Please see this, this documentary and listen to these songs and you'll understand why we're gushing so hard about it because it really is a special thing. Bye, everyone. Be blessed. Take care, Anthony. Anthony. Thanks for popping in. Okay, so, you know, it's it's an interesting question. I don't feel like um, I've stagnated. Um, For me, you know, I I don't know. I was like, I was going to therapy and uh, my whole life growing up, anytime I was depressed or suicidal or said, well, I was just born into this. I'm not, you know, honest hearted. I don't belong here. Um, that I, my, I'd always, my, my mom would send me to a therapist. So for me, like writing really kind of helped me to process and deal with things. There are a lot of embarrassing things in my story, but I mean, I would say pretty much, I mean, all the worst things about me are in there. <laughs> um, I just, I figured, you know, I don't want to be the the XJW with the worst exit, but and I'm not claiming I am. But if other people go through very acrimonious, painful things, 
I know when I first start, got on the XJW Reddit or I was on Twitter, I think it was Twitter, and someone was talking about how their child was kept from them. And they you could just tell their mental health was deteriorating. And then they disappeared. And then somebody posted an article they'd killed themselves. And I didn't know them very well. But and I and, and I can't stop that. But for me, if, if I didn't share the hell I went through, you know, I, I just felt compelled to. I felt that I had to because I don't want people to come out of this religion and kill themselves because it serves Watchtower's narrative. It serves that's what happens when you leave Jehovah and they don't care that you die. No one cares. They won't even have a funeral for you. Probably they'll, they'll say, well, hopefully he'll get a resurrection. You know, they, they do not care about mental health. And I feel like a big part of my story, which mentally disease kind of serves that, but you know, I, I just had this terrible depression. And every time I would go to a therapist, they would say, leave this religion, which I would interpret as Satan trying to draw me out. And I would quit and go back to them over and over. And uh, like I said, for me, you know, I put my story between two covers and, uh, and, and, you know, and I wrote the book for my son. Um, There even um, in the end of the book, there, um, there are three letters, one to my mother, one to my stepson, and one to my son. And they're, well, the one to my mother is an, an apology. It's just short. And I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that relationship is over. But for me, it just, being in Watchtower and beginning to suspect it was a cold during COVID, um, I just began binge drinking. And um, and of course, Watchtower, you know, I thought alcohol was safe because it was approved by God. <laughs> That's how naive I was. So, you know, when I was drinking 24 beers, then I went to hard liquor and I was drinking like a fifth of vodka a night and then bourbon, scotch, and it kept escalating. And uh, and I and I, I uh, yeah, I, 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 I wound up in jail, which I, I took. That's the middle of my memoir. And then the second portion is when um, I got into AA and it was the similarities and the thought terminating cliches. And and it was so much like being a Jehovah's witness that it was staggering to me. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of what jarred me in thinking, Oh, this isn't unique. This is all about control. Mm -hmm. And that was really what, because I would see all these people in AA talking about how they're doing crystal meth or, you know, hardcore drugs that I know nothing about and the fear that don't want anything to do with. And people would say, well, if you just pray every day, if you read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you come to meetings, and then I'd hear people say, I've never come to an AA meeting and not felt better afterwards, which is what I would hear about meetings at the kingdom hall. And mm -hmm. it was just horrifying. And I was stuck in this place. So I did not leave a cult. It was a lateral move. And it was just wave after wave of propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I just said, no, I refuse to pray. I don't believe in God. And even if he's real, I don't think he deserves worship. And they hated me for that. Wow. Interesting. For me, it's like the steamroller will not determine if the rock is destroyed. It is the rock. And, I, you know, I'm not calling myself the rock, but like just no. I absolutely will not, you know, be controlled that way anymore. Mm -hmm. And of course it was interpreted as, oh, you want everyone to do drugs or you're going to, I haven't touched alcohol in over three years and I work in a bar. You know, I, I said, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not, I'm a man of my word. Can we crack on? But there's no money in people mm -hmm. behaving that way. It's you're weak and you have a spiritual malady and all this. So mm -hmm. My so emphasis on your sin and your inability to function cool. without the higher power or the community. Oh, they, they told wow. me I had a spiritual malady and all these things. And wow. there were just, and every time I asked questions, nobody had answers. It was just, Oh, why are you asking? You think too much. You know, it was mm -hmm. so much, it was just a lateral move. And uh, yeah. so for me, I didn't care about the embarrassing stuff or stuff. I, I mean, there is stuff that I'm ashamed, but you know, 
it can't have been any other way as much as I, it, it's, I, I always hated hearing that. And I would hear old people and I'd be like, ah, oh, this idiot, but it's true. It can't have been any other way. It's a waste of time to wish it could have been. All you can do is not even plan for the future. I mean, you can do that, but you can live in the moment. And I, I like, after I published mentally diseased, I just remember like I was walking one day and I just felt so good. And it was like, I, that someone had sent me a message told me it resonated with them. And I was like, I'm living in the moment, you know, and I never have done that. So I, I think it's a great thing. Maybe it's not for everybody to, uh, cause I have had negative, a few negative comments, maybe like one or 2%. Overall, people have been very supportive or even, you know, I mean, there is a lot of darkness in it, but people have said, you know, like, they thought it was well written. It's just a, it's a lot of very very dark stuff. Um, man, I, there's a couple of things I want to quick say before we wrap up. But um, I went to AA as a supporter for a friend back in Colorado, like ten years ago, and she had, it was like her seventh year sober. And uh, I never I went there just to check it out, and I was astonished by the similarities of how things were formulated to, to yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses. And then at the time I was living in a community living situation, a commune, it was like an anarchist commune. It was a bunch of like people in the burbs, you know, trying to like yeah. do something new in their mind. It was a new thing. Um, and people have been making community living spaces for centuries. But anyway, so they had this like kind of vibrant, fun community. And I liked a lot of the people there. And it was like a couple hundred people, but it was like this house of like 20. Anyway, I, it was the next Mormon couple there from utah and so i was like oh man check this out dude we were friends right and i was like and he, he knew i was an ex-fitness and i was like i just went to my new favorite call he's like oh which one and i was like hey, hey. and then we high-fived and then <laughs> <laughs> it was like this really funny moment that only ex-cult members would like totally get like it's yeah. there, and we talked about some of the similarities of aa to mormons and jehovah's witnesses but then like someone in our community had just started going to aa and i didn't know that and they were in another room and i didn't even know they were in the building and then I got like, then I realized how culty the place I was living was because um, yeah. there was some weird rule that you can like oust someone forever without asking anyone else. And like everyone has the power to kick out someone from the community forever. And I was like, we have a shunning policy here. <laughs> what, what, what am I a part of right now? I thought this is just like a bunch of, you know, my community, like trying to do something new and empowering. Um, anyway, so there's like a whole story there, but. In the end, I, I made up with that person and helped them understand that I, calling AA a cult was a joke, not like a yeah. damnation on the process for them and their jer alcohol journey. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> it's, it's very culty, people. And oh, it, it has problems. <laughs> oh, and, and, and the success rate is not good. Mm. And, you know, like if, if, if you ask me why I believe something, I would tell you. But when I've asked those people, they get really mad. And they can't, you, they're like, well, not, they'd be like, well, the big book says, and I'm like, ah, I've read it. I don't agree with it. And, but yeah, there, there's just no room for it. You either conform or you're perceived as this other almost evil. Mm. Like you're attacking their faith in that system or something. Well, so they have shaming terms too: dry, drunk and terminally unique, which I've been called both. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, so it, it's you 100% accept the dogma or you're those things mm. or you never had a problem to begin with. It's whatever the house always wins. Yeah, it's, it's mm. you know, I mean, but I, at least I wound up there because it, it made me realize because, the you know, con, conf, confronting the truth when you really think Satan is in your mind controlling you is it's, that's a hard thing to overcome. Yeah. Could you, we're going to wrap here. We got a minute left. Could you give the audience, um, talk about your book inclusion in the, in the Kickstarter, what you think of the Kickstarter and maybe like wrap up, like how you, how it's going for you. Um, yeah. How to get involved. Um, a witness underground is a really cool documentary and I'm very proud to have my, uh, my book trilogy be a part of it. I think you should definitely check it out. Um, uh, like and share and donate if you can. And, you know, uh, almost a year ago, I published a memoir, and then that led to me publishing a second book and then writing a third. And even this year earlier, I spoke to the attorney general and PA, and then you reached out to me to help with this. Like, writing a book has just, 
it's been how I reinvented myself and it's been a great journey. And I'm just, I'm very flattered and humbled to be a part of it. Cool. Really appreciate it. I'm so happy to have your book as a part of the campaign and to get to know you. When I first started seeing your interviews pop up, I was like, oh, this guy's, this guy's got a voice and he's interesting. Um, so I really appreciate it, um, what you have to say. And I'm, I'm glad you're still going for it. And it's interesting to like make a piece of art with my film, with your books. Um, all of a sudden, like now you're part of this community of people who made a film and a book and like, that's a different world, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's very cool. And even like, sometimes I'll be like, yeah, my, I'll be like, yeah, I got to make a call to my friend, my filmmaker friend, Scott. And like, it's just, it, you know, it, it's just cool to, to know people that are actually doing things that are akin to what you want to do, because, you know, I just love art. I can tell you, do you can tell everybody involved with this does, and hopefully it draws people that, you know, not only appreciate it, but want to get involved too, because it's a really, really cool thing. Yeah. That's one of the big goals is what happens after this is like the collaborations that you and I can do, Anthony. I mean, Anthony and I are actually just getting to know each other as well. And you guys have been a really big part of this and Denise and England. And then there's like another group of like 10 more people who have channels and have projects of their own that are super cool that are like trying to help and get the word out. And it's it's working. And we've at 64% this morning on our Kickstarter. We have 10 more days to go. And, and I'm really curious about how like putting this out there will bring artists out of the woodwork to like, Oh, that's cool. Or like people might want to start making art. I want to encourage people to go yeah. write that bad chapter of a book and publish it on your blog or whatever yeah. the thing is that you get excited to do. I really appreciate you uh, giving your voice to the project and, and lending your art to it and coming on to the interview. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Scott. Yeah. Everybody check out the apostasy trilogy and you can get it right now as part of witness underground.com. Our Kickstarter is live. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye, guys. Check it out. <laughs>